Good morning, everybody. We're welcome. Want to welcome you to this live conversation with Pat Gelsinger. Pat is the CEO of VMware. They are a global uh, multi-billion-dollar cloud solutions company. Uh, Pat is a leading technology uh, person in the in the world, really. Uh, first chief technology officer of Intel Corporation and a great friend of William Jessup University. Uh, Pat, thank you for participating in this brief conversation. My pleasure. Thank you for. Uh having the opportunity to chat with you all today. It's great. Hey, Pat, what, you had the opportunity to work with some legendary leaders at Intel, and uh, what are some two or three things that you learned uh, during that time that you're using right now uh, in real time during this crisis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, uh, you know, one of, one of them was Andy Grove, um, and uh, he was a mentor of mine for 30 plus years, you know, and if you're gonna be mentored by somebody in the technology field, Andy's not a bad choice, but I used to joke that uh, getting mentored with Andy was like going to the, the dentist and not getting Novocaine. Tough, demanding, hard. If you were 95% right, you were wrong, right? You know, and he was just brutal on the uh, uh, edges. And, you know, one of the things uh, near the end of Andy's uh, reign uh, at uh, Intel was how he pounded on values, yes. right, and the criticality of values and culture, and that's something that uh, you know I've just been building into VMware, and now in a crisis period like this, I get to harvest that, right, and seeing teams be doing all this community engagement and supporting that uh, everywhere, and I'll say, you know, you make those investments all the time, and then you see moments like this where you get to harvest them at scale. You know, I also, uh, you know, clearly in a period like this, uh, empathy and, uh, you know, being able to demonstrate, you know, that true affection for your teams, your people, the support for them. And uh, my first uh, 20 years of my career, right, you know, the opportunity uh, to do more work was the greatest reward you should have for any project well done. Mm. Right. Yeah. More. You know, there was no empathy. There was no encouragement. Right. You know, we were here to get stuff done. And, uh, you know, in the last uh, 20 years of my career, you know, you always start on the personal. Right. Mm. You know, and just building those. And even if, you know, you might be talking to somebody for an hour and only spend two, three, four minutes on it. Right. You know, it just builds a bond uh, that allows you to connect in so much more uh, powerful uh, ways. And uh, now, you know, that might be the only thing they want to talk about uh, in this period of time. And like I was on the phone with my India team last night at uh, about 1030 and they were telling me one of their employees and, you know, they're all in a shelter in place, must work from home. And one of our support engineers, he is supporting U.S. Uh, pro projects. So he is working in the middle of the night. He has his three kids his uh, parents living in a two bedroom apartment with him, right? Wow. He's partitioned half the bathroom to become his office at home that he's on the phone at, you know, all, you know the, the late hours of the night supporting our customers. Wow, you know, those are the kind of stories that one, you're just warmed in the heart, but you're saying like, absolutely, you know, what else can I do to support you? And there's really not much that you can do yeah. in, in this environment as well. So empathy, uh, care and truly uh, supporting the uh, people and the part of your teams in these very unique periods of time. Well, Pat, I love that. And I so appreciate uh, the way you've demonstrated that. Um, when you think about uh, these current times, you're a person of faith. Uh, that's fairly public knowledge. And uh, as a person of faith, I, I know I struggle with fear. I, I was uh, worried about the technology this morning and <laughs> had some uh, problems. And you could appreciate that. Uh, so how do you manage fear? You're the leader. Uh, you're in the middle of a crisis. You've got to make hard decisions. But I know that fear comes in. How do you manage fear as a person of faith? Yeah, and, you know, if you think about being nervous, being uncertain, uh, the risk of failure, the uh, uh, fear of the business, uh, the unknown, those things, they are God-given emotions, right? And the question isn't whether you're going to have fear, uncertainty, doubts. The question then is, how do you manage them, yeah. right? Because fundamentally, these are good things that God has put into us, 
right? You know, the, you know, the fear responses have you know, kept people alive for many, many years. So the question then is how do you manage them, right? And to me, right, what you need to be able to do is harness the energy associated with those fears and turn them into productive outcomes, right? And uh, be able to take that nervousness before a speech, harness the energy and make the speech better. To take the uncertainty before a meeting on a critical topic and do more homework. To take the uh, fear of failure and make sure that you've studied the risks associated with it even harder. And at the end of the day, your job as a leader then, right, is to bring those together across your leadership team and make decisions, right, go forward. And if you're not ready to make decisions as a leader, you're not a leader, right? Get out of the chair and put somebody in who is. In this environment, you'll be making decisions with less certainty than you would have otherwise, right? So maybe normally you say, hey, I want to be 80% certain before I make a decision. In this environment, that might be 70 or 60% but you need to decide, right? And for that then, you say, hmm, I'm accountable for this decision, right? And then transparency and accountability to your teams, to your companies, to your organization. I made that decision. And if it fails, me. And if it succeeds, you, you right? right? And you're pouring that onto your teams, the successes and the willingness. And that transparency builds more loyalty, more commitment, right? And more honor from your teams because in this period, they are looking for leaders who are ready to lead. I love everything you said, Pat, and I've tried to model that uh, even in our own organization. Um, you have a leadership accountability that few of us can imagine. I don't remember your exact employee count, but it's certainly 20, 25,000, maybe above. 32,000 now. 32,000. 32,000 people. Okay. So 32,000 souls. There we go. 32,000 souls. You're pastoring the largest church that I know of. Uh, so you think about that accountability. How do you work with a large leadership team? I, I know it's concentric circles, but you're in a crisis. You've got to get good communication out to 32,000 people. And then I'm sure you have regional leaders. You have your people closest to you in physical proximity who are now mediated through technology. How do you communicate and lead well in the midst of a crisis. Yeah, and uh, so, some of this is obvious, but just emphasizing again, communicate, communicate, communicate. And when you're done communicating, communicate some more, yes. right? <laughs> you really are, you know, and I had a company all hands uh, this week that we did virtually. So I had about 20,000 of my 30,000 uh, on connections this week. I don't think I said anything particularly new, compelling, you know, I didn't think I was particularly pithy or smart, but the feedback from the teams has been overwhelmingly positive. Oh, thank you, Pat. That was so good, right? Communicate, communicate, communicate uh, to the teams. You know, also you, you do manage through concentric circles, you know, that inner circle uh, as well. And for those, you know, I'm on conversations with almost every one of the, you know, my inner uh, circle of about 10 people. I'm conversing with them almost every day. Right? even more than under normal uh, circumstance. And it may be a five minute conversation. It may be an hour long one-on-one, -on -one, maybe in joint things, but it's even more critical and particularly since you're not physically together to over uh, engage with them because they become the circles that then allow your directions, plans to ripple uh, through the uh, organization. Um, and I'm doing uh, weekly uh, town halls with all of my VPs and above, which is about 800 uh, VPs and directors of the uh, company, because that's when the real work gets done. And nice. so every week we're doing uh, calls with them, open Q&A times with uh, every uh, one of them. And that puts a lot more pressure on you as a leader. Yes. Right. You know, because, you know, looking into this stupid little uh, camera and being, you know, engaged and compelling and energetic is even harder than doing that when you get to feed off the energy of an audience when you right. might be face to face. Well, as a communicator and as somebody who does this on a pretty regular basis, but not to the size of audience you do, I can tell you communicators, uh, especially like me, uh, depend on feedback from the audience. And so it is uh, challenging when you are just looking at a screen that uh, we did this uh, the other day with about 300 on and it was challenging, uh, but yeah. it's, it's also energizing. Pat, you're in the technology industry and when we think about managing during a crisis, the technology industry, maybe more than any other, is accustomed to change. 
Uh, so maybe you understand change more than the rest of us. Some of us uh, are in industries who might be listening in on this conversation. They're not as accustomed to change. Mm -hmm. Are there any change principles that you could help us understand? Uh, I know a lot of the work is done before, but now that I'm in the midst of a crisis and I've got to change, any change principles? You talked about communication. You talked about uh, empathy and caring. Uh, any other either process or uh, things that you could help us with uh, about managing change in the midst of a crisis? Yeah, maybe three different comments. And, you know, one of my favorite management phrases is never waste a good crisis. So good. Right. Right. And, you know, your organization is perfectly designed to do what it's doing. That's right. And if you want to change its direction, everything about the organization is not wanting to change. You know, the peoples, the processes, the systems, you know, the customer, all that stuff is just re rebuilding exactly in that path. So when you have a crisis, what a tremendous time to accelerate change, right? Which then leads to my second favorite phrase is figure out where you want to go and then get there faster, right? You know, and anything that's distracting you from that true north that you see as the path, just get it out of the way and just aim for that more aggressively. Whatever project is distracting it, whatever systems, this is your opportunity to get there faster. And, uh, in fact, I've laid out uh, to my leadership team uh, right now, we call it FTTF, faster to the future, right? Wow. And we're going to use this period of time to get to the vision that we've laid out. And as I've said, it probably would take us 24 months to transform the organization with the new visions, business strategies, things that we've uh, just launched uh, in uh, February of this year in our new fiscal years. We started it, laid out the new plan. And I said, I want as much of that crammed into the next four months as possible, because by the middle of the year, I want the new orgs launched, the new uh, teams, the new sales models, all of those to be put in place faster to the future. So, then, Pat, Pat, I'm yeah. going to use that phrase faster to the future. I'm going to give you credit one time and then I'm going to steal it and pretend like I invented it. All yours. No problem. No problem. I love uh, maybe that. I'll put it in, maybe I'll make it a chapter in my next book, but we'll you see should. You uh, should. on that. So, right. Don't waste the crisis faster to the future. Um, and then be super clear with the team then and who's empowered, who's accountable for the different pieces. And your job as a leader is very much to bestow, right. The authority the resources, the capacity to go execute the different project, but then hold them accountable to go yeah. deliver uh, against them. And, you know, if I've given you this uh, project, John, and I say, great, you know, I want an update in two weeks. I've disempowered me for the next two weeks to be managing it, right? And I need to be fully empowering you. But two weeks from now, I want an update. Right? <laughs> you know, and you're holding them accountable as well. And then, you know, if it's not going well, Part of your job, John, is what, what's not working, right? I need to know, right? If you're not doing that, then you're not accountable. And obviously, I picked the wrong guy. Didn't, and, you know, it didn't lay out the project well, didn't hold them accountable, didn't give them the necessary uh, resources as well. And that's really the contract and the commitment of execution and accountability. I love that, Pat. Uh, along those lines, one of the things I heard you say uh, that I really appreciate, uh, I've phrased it a little different here, is everything we're doing now about getting to the future fast is about reducing friction. Uh, so many times there's change resistance and friction, and we have this amazing opportunity right now. And so I want to shift. We're in a global crisis, and we're managing in the midst of this crisis. And, and I'm a praying person. I know you're a praying person. We're praying that this will uh, resolve quickly and that uh, lives will be spared. There will be a moment, Pat, when we come out of this, and I'm a person of faith, as I know you are, we're going to come out of this stronger, better, faster. What are some things that you're thinking, either for your organization or for the future of our world, our, our nation, our world, mm -hmm. that, that actually, having gone through this crisis, what are some good things that we can look for on the other side? Because there will be another side. There will yeah. be another side. So what, what are some things to look forward to? Yeah, so let me start by one from one of our customers. And I was on the phone this morning with uh, Jose Arietta, who happens to be the CIO for HHS, 
right? You know, the uh, uh, health and human services uh, for the United States, you know, huge responsibility, wow. right? Wow. You know, just enormous responsibility uh, for this guy. And, you know, we're chatting and uh, there is no new technology required for telemedicine, none. Frankly, there's been no new technology required for the last decade for telemedicine. But it ain't happened. Why? Because a bunch of regulatory, legal, state boundaries, certification, you know, union things that have prevented it from having any meaningful impact until this week. Now, essentially 10 years, right, of morass is being solved in one week, right? You know, as that happens. And is that going to make healthcare better? You bet it is. Is it going to make it more efficient, more cost effective, you know, right? You know, safer. You bet it is. Uh, and those kind of things. So to me, that's just dislocative. And as I say, you know, we will, after COVID, we will never work, learn, play, social, live, worship the way we did before. It will fundamentally change every aspect. And we're going to see that there's going to be, you know, projects that might have taken years, decades, social changes that might have never occurred that now will happen almost overnight. Right. And I think for every business and for us, you know, one of our product areas specifically in mobile distributed workforce. So, hey, we're seeing a big spike in demand. So that's going to be good for us. But then it's sort of, well, how do we make, and even in the church or in the business setting, how do you make it better? It isn't just sort of accommodating, but how do I make my mobile distributed new better than it was before? And, you know, in the business setting, hmm, I had about 5,000 workers who were work from home or distributed workforce on my 32,000. My goal, right, and as we're raising the company, we said five years from now, we expect to be about 50,000 employees. My goal would be instead of maybe 10% of my company being work from home, how could I make it 40 or 50%? Wow. Right. You know, and just radically. And with that, being able to say there are people that I can't hire today because they don't live in expensive Bay Area, right? Right. Right. Hey, you know it's okay to live in Bodong, Iowa, right? You know they're you know maybe work from home mothers, huh? You know now we really are pretty good at that, right? Or you know maybe uh, carbon footprint. Wow, you don't need to commute, right? And by the way, the, the if you haven't seen, there's a, a wonderful picture of the global carbon footprint reduction that's occurred because people aren't commuting. Wow. Right? Maybe it's okay for only one day to come into the office versus five or two days. You know, it's okay, right, to go do it, right? You know, there's going to be so many good things and even how we worship, right, in the church context, uh, yes. John, as we've talked about. Hmm, wow, you know, let's, we, we can have a church of a million people, right? right? You know, we can have people who would never come into the doors. Now it's one click away come online there's going to be people that were reached church capacity that's available you know peoples that aren't available and it's not just that we're going to have a mediocre broadcast of today's service how do we make it better than it could have ever been before yeah i uh, so I, i'm going to re-listen to this pat because you're so uh, spot on on so many of these things i know we're getting close on time and i want to give you one more uh, question that's come in from our audience but i I want to just say to you, uh, I have a feeling, like you said, that how we live, how we learn, how we work, how we play, how we worship, all of those dimensions are going to be challenged and changed by COVID. And I'm really struck that we have greater than ever opportunities to connect with people and, and connect across distance and engage our customer maybe more than ever before. So, um, Here's just, we've had several questions, Pat. I'm so sorry that I'm always able to get to a few, but here's one more because we're getting close on time. When you look for employees that are highly adaptable in these challenging circumstances, what are some of those qualities? And, uh, and then maybe if you could tag onto this, um, how, um, how have you struggled with obstacles where you said, I can't solve them right now. I just got to manage in the midst of the crisis. So uh, mm -hmm. What are the qualities for employees that are helpful? And then what are some things you say, no, I'm not going to solve this right now until we get through this period? Yeah, you know, employees that sort of, you know, embrace change, you know, often the disruptors. Uh, I call, uh, you, you know, you can see the pathfinders by the arrows in their backs, yeah. right? You know, they're often the ones that break glass right, in different uh, settings uh, as well. You know, 
often you find they have different interpersonal issues as well because they're the ones that are you know charging forward and those are exactly the kind of people that you need in these kind of environments and of course you're doing everything you can to manage around their rough edges and you know deal with some of the challenges associated with it but they are going to be the ones that make these catapulting moves right and lead the organization and you as a leader need to be able to protect them manage some of those gaps because the organization wants to kill those suckers right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 we were doing just fine if it wasn't for you yeah. right you know kind of thing and so you need to be carefully managing you know the bigger organization and those teams those projects those disruptive efforts right you'll know, bring the right capacity behind them because you know their success essentially becomes the success of the organization over time so you're managing all those rough edges and then you're you're building the capacity in this new area behind them and if you don't do that top down it will not work right highly top down because you need to be able to manage those bridges between the organization protect those projects because everything wants to suck the life out of them right, right as well so you need to protect the resources on them and then ensure that they become mainstreamed in an effective way that the true full breadth of the organization can come on uh, alongside of them. Pat, I just uh, so appreciate it. What most people wouldn't know is that today, absent COVID, uh, you would have been speaking live in our chapel, and then you would have been speaking live at the opening of our Global Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. I got a promise from you that you would come back to chapel. If we work it out right, could we get you back live, uh, if it works for your schedule? Because uh, you've been so helpful to us today. Yeah, happy to love to do that. And I know that this is you're getting, uh, you know, whatever it is, 25, 30 witnesses here to uh, measure that uh, commitment to come back. Uh, you know, I, I see I see your uh, evil scheme here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm actually wanting to double my my uh, pleasure and opportunity to be with Pat Gelsinger. Thank you, Pat, for your valuable time. Thanks for helping me understand managing during a crisis. And you've just uh, encouraged and affirm, I think, a global audience today. Very good. Thank you all. Thank God you. bless. God bless.